Welcome to our latest Cart Fix Live. Tonight marks our 40th episode, and the main purpose of the Cart Fix Live is to do an interactive Q&A with you, the member. So get your questions in, anything cart fishing related, anything about our content, um, any general cart fishing queries, and I'll do my best to answer them, Scott as well. Um, but while you're getting your questions in, I'll have a brief talk about our recent releases, starting with our Gigantica Social. Now, the, um, the Gigantica Social went really, really well. We split over two parts and in part one um i fished in a swim called big southerly now big southerly is um not a swim that i'd normally plump for not one of the sort of main central swims that i really sort of love to get into but on arrival that's where the fish were and you know i'm always preaching fish to what you see and that's exactly what i did got in there and i caught on the first night a fish called um the patch fully now you know when you go to gigantica you, you know there's her, like loads and loads and loads of big fish in there named ones old ones ones you dearly love to catch and um that one has been on my list for as long as i can remember I always sit there look at it in the um in the lodge where you eat your dinner and um, see the picture of it on the wall so to finally catch that one was really really cool but that was sort of i don't know uh, wait what to how to describe the situation but I caught one on the first night and then the first evening and then blanked three consecutive nights in a row. A um, few fish were getting caught around the lake by the members um, and I felt pretty stranded. You know, very, Quite quickly I was regretting my choice of going in Big Southerly and originally the Alcatraz swim had been taken and then um, the guy that had been in Alcatraz moved to Oblivion and it sort of stayed empty for a couple of days. And obviously I'm looking at it from the other side of the lake thinking, done really well in there in December. Done really well in there in the past. It's sort of, it's one of the, the better swims on the lake. Quite weedy at this time in, at moment in time. Hadn't been informed, but I really feel with that, that swim in particular, that if you can find some good spots, like clean gravel areas, 30 to 33 wraps out, get your bait out over the top, then you've always got a chance. And we were very fortunate in that it was the first week that they were trialling baiting from the boat. So you could um, put your mark float out in the daytime and the bailiff would go out with your bucket of bait and spread it around the float. And um, yeah, that being the first to take advantage of that was a, a big edge. And having struggled in Big Southerly for three nights, it absolutely kicked off. I think I had, 24 bites out of Alcatraz in, in four nights, which is, you know, 20 bites in a week is really good going on, on Gigantic. So 24 in four nights is really some 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 going. Didn't get into any of the real big ones, but, you know, great action, especially around dinner time and stuff. We're all socialising up at the lodge and, um, you know, yeah, it was, it was good fun. But the biggest fish of the week came out, to a guy called Ben and he was fishing over in the Alamo I think he had a 60 low 60 pounder um but yeah a, a great time had by all tactics wise the fish were super tuned to um sort of the hemp that they sell there the maize the pellet and I was fishing plastic on the hook because of the crayfish and other people were catching on other stuff but the the go-to was the the house spod mix if you like with plastic hook baits and sort of, I was sort of following on the back of what we'd done at Three Islands Lake, having built a bit of confidence fishing where there's lots of crayfish with particles. It seemed quite logical to sort of carry that approach onto Gigantica. Although the crays are not nearly as um, sort of in the same amount, of they're not in the same numbers at Gigantica. Um, it still felt good to have plastic on the hook, knowing that even if the crayfish did find it, that they probably move, leave it and then move on to the free offering so um yeah that, that was good other than the gigantica films um we've recently released me trying uh the new long shanked beaked point hooks over at embryo baston serpentine lake now we only went for a couple of nights and perhaps should have gone when you're going to test something and you want to collect a bit of data you should have perhaps should i should have perhaps 
chose somewhere a little bit more prolific, somewhere I was going to get more bites because over the two night session on the Serpentine Lake, I only had two bites, landed the first one, lost the second one. And it's not really, um, it's not enough data. If you're going to test something to, to know if it's good or you're getting on with it, you need to to have lots of data and by lots of data I mean lots of bites to sort of prove or disprove anything that you're trying to achieve now I like the pattern hook long shank hooks turn more aggressively um, quickly um, when tension to the lead the beak point should keep them in well held in the mouth but yeah the jury's out I need to um, I need to do some more testing and I think I'll probably probably go over Blasford at some point during this winter, Blasford is my sort of local day ticket lake where you've got a real good chance of catching a few. So, uh, yeah, I'll give them another run out at some point before I commit to uh, to uh, any sort of, yeah, big carp campaigns using the new new hooks. Well, not new hooks, but the new hooks to me is what I mean. Um, but other than those two releases, I recently went to Grenville with Scott mm. <laughs> so we, we went there it was, it was like yeah Scott said come over we'll go for we'll make a little film over Grenville and uh, it was just before the full moon I'd done no homework prior to our arrival we literally just rolled up looked around in the morning waited to see where we saw some fish jumping um, I got first pick because Scott was filming um, and we did see him out in front of swim 17 not many just a few shows and it was i want to say mid-september was it mid-september yeah i think it was yeah mid-september and it's sort of that transition period where you're it's still warm in the daytime but it's cool at night and i was sort of in my head thinking are they in the deep water yet or not are they in the deep water but are they willing to feed in sort of 28 30 feet of water at that time of year you know there's a lot of the bites have been coming from the cabin swim in shallower water um but just in the in the few days leading up to our session there's been a, a few bites out of the deeper parts of the lake which obviously gives you a little bit of confidence but long story short is plumbed up in the area where i'd seen the activity 35 wraps out paul went out to my marker float put out a load of um main line ice I think it's about 15 kilos or so blasted the rigs out over the top and then you sort of once you've put your marker out where you've seen fish had your bait drop cast your rigs out you're sort of wondering if they're still there do you know Scott's next door we've got our rods out as far as we can sort of chuck them with a the wind off our back and it, you don't really see anything jump in the afternoon and it's like I did see a few actually further much mm, further yeah, out like yeah. under the wires and yeah. like in front of the lodge um and I, when I went to bed, I wasn't sitting there. Th- I wasn't going to bed thinking I'm definitely going to catch tonight. You know, it wasn't one of those nights. But next thing you know, it's early hours in the morning, flat, calm, bright, wasn't it? The moon, bright was moonlight, mm. crisp as well, cold, yeah, wasn't it? Was, it? Yeah. Um, had a take. Obviously, you're fishing at long range with monofilament, so it's got quite stretchy. Felt like a decent fish, but there's loads of big fish in Grenville, so it's, it wasn't like abnormally feeling massive. But um, got in the weed a little bit on the shelf on the way in. And then as it popped up on camera, on the camera light, on the head torch as it went in there, we were both like, that's massive, <laughs> that's massive. Um, and it turned out to be one of the 60 pounders in there. It wasn't 60 pound in weight at the time, but um, it's been caught earlier in the year over 60 pound. Was it 50, 57? 57 something. 57, yeah. 12. Yeah. Um, and when you think about the odds of catching, you know, there's, 2,000 or more carp in Grenville's to catch one off the top handful of fish. I think there's four or five fish in there around that sort of size. Um, so you're looking like 500 to one um, and to get that on your first bite after having not been there since spring. Pure luck, absolute pure luck um, of which one picked up the bait. But um, yeah, I was pleased. Scotty got in on the action as well, didn't you? I kept my average at 38 pounds. Well, not my average. My top my top fish in there, 38. I've had about three or four 38s. Just can't get over a 38 pounds. I think once you do, you'll just... I it, don't know. It's just one of those things, isn't it? You just like, you can't pick which which fish yeah. picks up your I bait. See, like a guy on there from Scotland, He goes, I've seen him a few times there. His first fish was 60 pounds. Yeah. Like, okay. 
Yeah. But it's just, it literally is one of those just... You, you Keep s- catching. Yes. Like, law yeah. of averages. Yeah. The next fish should be a 40 pounder. Yeah. You're, you're, um, you're overdue a 40 pounder. You might even just skip the 40. You might I skip I the 50 and go straight, to. <laughs> straight to the 60. You, yeah, you, job done. Job done. <laughs> you, you never know. No, I'd, I'd like to go up in those increments just like for my own, like, you know, yeah, yeah, it's nice. It's all part of the the, yeah. the journey, but um, but yeah, we could, we had a few, and yeah, it was good. So that film's in the in the pipe, which yeah, yeah. So it'll be two separate films. So it'll be your your. Yeah. I'll have my normal vlog, vlog on there, which will actually cover from springtime because between spring and September, I didn't fish there, so yeah. I've been off there for like four or five months just because of doing work. Um, so I've not fished there all of that time. So it'll cover a little bit at the start, which I've got some crazy footage actually of the fish showing on the long lens from spring. Yeah. So I'll, I'll show a bit of that. Um, and then, um, yeah, your 57 and the two others you yeah. caught, they'll be a separate 35, film. 35, 36 pounds, yeah. Yeah. So it'll be, yeah, it'll be a standalone film from your session and then there'll be a vlog. So. Yeah. Um, and Val- Luke Valerie's been out this week as well. He's been catching a few at Pump House, so yeah. that'll be a good watch in uh, in a few weeks. Should we go to some questions? Yeah, I'm ready for some questions. We've got Liam Banks. Um, He's yeah, a regular. G- yeah, get your questions in. If you've got anything autumnal based, um, send autumnal. them in. It'll be nice to have a few, like, you know, yeah, I don't know. Seasonal questions. Like, yeah, just anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, Liam Banks. Evening, lads. Hope you're well. Daryl, I'm currently on a water that is ridiculously weedy and struggling to find spots. When I get into a swim um, and I'm on fish, I'm por- paranoid that with the amount of leading required to find a spot, I'll spook them off. Any advice? Also, how long would you spend finding a spot? Sometimes it takes hours to find any clear ground. Very, very good question, that. Um, ultimately, a lot of the time, depending on the weed, but... Uh, if you're telling me that you need to find clear ground, really, you want to be doing that ahead of your fishing. So spend as much time when you're at the lake wandering around with your leading rod in swims so that you know where the clear spots are within the swims so that when on future sessions, when you see fish in a swim, you already know where the spots are. You know That, that is the biggest edge you can have in cam- campaign fishing is having your spots dialed in. So you've done, you've put the time into each swim, having a lead round, found where the clear spots are, you've clipped them up, you've wrapped them around your distance sticks, you know what tree it is, you write that down into the notes section of your telephone, and um, then you're, for, you're armed to the next time that you're in that swim and the fish are there. Obviously when you, if, if that isn't the case, when you're finding fish in a swim and you're trying to get your rods out, you're trying to do it as discreetly as possible but at the same time when you're fishing in th- around thick weed and you're trying to find cl- small clear spots around that you know the precision involved you can't do that in a couple of casts you need to have you're going to n- need to make a lot of casts to check your work as in you're going to find the clear spots you're going to check your clips you're going to see how far left and right you can go of where you found it i get it you know you're going to make a lot of disturbance um one option is that you fish sort of just pop up rigs and fish for drops when when you're in a situation where you're on fish you know it's weedy out there you don't want to scare them off by plumbing you can fish pop up rigs with the beads high up your leg core high up your main lines cast them out feel for drops with light leads and just try and nick a fish in that situation but going back to what how i started with this reply i would I would say the biggest edge you can have is to get a load of spots in your note note section of your telephone so that when you walk into these swims, when you find fish, you can literally just wrap up around your sticks and get out in a couple of casts. Beautiful. Yeah. Let me just skip back. I was just getting a little push notification out. <laughs> a little push. Um, Gaz the Jailer. I don't think I've seen that username before. No. Gaz the Jailer. We've got a, maybe, a, maybe they've changed their screen name. Um, or they've uh, they're a new member. Is so he, welcome is, if you are a new member. Is he because he's jailing carp? He's putting Gaz the J. Yeah, get, getting him in the old <laughs> tensions thing, putting him in the cells. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've just ordered three kais and greens in twelve foot three and a half pound test curve and a twelve foot spod. Uh, when you were testing the greens, 
did you test different reels for a good balance or have you always just used the same reels regardless? I'm looking at buying new reels too and not sure what would match up well. Do you have a top three? Cheers, lads. Well, I've actually got the 12 foot, three and a half pound uh, Kais and Greens myself. Um, nice all round rod, not an out and out chucker, not a margin rod, a good all rounder. Um, with regards to balance, obviously I've got what reels I've got. You know, I've got bases, um, but I've also recently got some spod reels. Um, the new, I think they're called super spods. Now, obviously it depends on your budget. You know, your budget's going to be your your real deciding factor. And in my opinion, once you get to that sort of um, one hundred and fifty pound price point. Uh, per reel you're starting to get good quality items you know anything below 150 quid is yeah real entry level and you're not going to get much i wouldn't say bang for your book much, much, <laughs> much, well, you're not say bang for your book, but you're not going to get anything that's that good once you're un, when you're like under 100 quid you, you're going to get reels that are going to do the job uh, but they're going to feel a bit yeah they're not going to feel the best um, but once you get to 150 quid, there's loads of reels out there, you know, from Shimano, from Daiwa, Fox, Sonic, whoever. Um, and also, it's, it's mainly down to what you like the look of. Um, obviously, like I say, I've got bases. They're super, super lightweight. But those super spots that I've recently got, they're just a fractional bit heavier um but they wind in a lot faster so i quite like them and i i think quite often i think spot reels are underpriced i think they're they're designed to be hard wearing um they might be a little bit heavier than your normal sort of cart reel maybe a tiny bit but i think for they're so well priced that i would yeah i would recommend you to look at them cool yeah uh we have got one from mick the greek Quite Mick. regular on here, isn't he? On yep. Mick. Uh, have you ever used a bait boat with a naked choddy? If so, would it still work effectively and present okay? I haven't, but I fished it. I fished hinges in the boat quite a lot um, with a top bead, say four inches up. And the only difference between that and a naked chod would be how high you had the bead. For me, the, one of the most important things when you're dropping rigs from bait boats is to have the hook point foamed up. Now, you, you'll see that when I'm casting, I never, ever foam up the hook point because I think it takes me out of my rhythm. I don't like the way it flails about in the air. I don't think it casts as true with that on there. But when you're dropping from a bait boat, if you're using a naked shot, you could have a little foam nugget on there and always drop. Don't never drop on a really tight line. So you take it out to where you want to take it. And I would say always like just before you're about to drop it, just give it a bit of slack. Like if you're holding the rod under a certain amount of tension, just drop the rod like a metre or so, half a metre to let the line go slack. So that when you open the doors, the rig free falls rather than going pew, like firing away because you don't want it to fire away from the bait. So I always take it out until I'm exactly happy where it is take a bit of slack into it open the doors and you you feel it go suddenly go tight as the lead catches up with your rod and i'm anticipating that and i follow it down and if you follow it down your trolley will come up to that top bead with the foam nugget on and it will be doing exactly as you want it to be doing cool yeah. Uh, Jonathan Cooksey, evening Daryl and Scott. I have a question regarding long shank hooks in solid bags. I normally use crank and co uh, and concerted to uh, long shank. Now I'm getting hook pulls. Any ideas? Uh, both used in size six. So he's now using long shanks and now getting hook pulls. Yeah. I, I, that's what, yeah. Yeah. I I think long shank hooks are more prone to hook pulls, and the reason for that is if you think of it like a crowbar. You know, when you have uh, something that's longer and you add force at one end, it's magnified down at the other end. It's like increasing the force. So although it turns faster, I don't think it holds as well, in my opinion. I think when you're fishing solid bags and just in general, shorter shank hooks with wide gapes will naturally hold better than longer shank hooks with narrower gapes. Like, But one is like... One stays in the mouth bower, 
one catches in the mouth better. So it's it, it your your um you know one they both do the opposite things better than the other. Um, so yeah, I would say if you're if you're suffering hook pulls with long shanks, go back to what you were doing, like short shank hooks, cranks, wide gapes, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, Chris Lines has asked, Hi both, not so much a question, but I think it would be good to mention carping etiquette. Not enough of it nowadays, and I think it should be mentioned more on a whole. Have you got any thoughts on carping? Have you got any funny stories on carping etiquette? Well, <laughs> when, when you're thinking about etiquette, you're always thinking it, about it from your own point of view so like let's say that you're in the swim you're already in a swim you're on fish your rods are out all nicely and then you've got the guy who's just arriving right he's just coming to the lake but like you he wants to catch fish and like you he wants to be on the fish now he could walk around the lake and go down the other end of the lake and if there's if it's a lake full of fish then going down the other end of the lake finding his own bit of fishing great idea you know like spread yourselves out a bit you know but at the same time if there's only a handful of fish in a lake what do you do, do you, what are you going to go camp down the other end of the lake and yeah you know so that it i i i do understand there are times you know etiquette is like you treating people as you wish to be treated that is basically what etiquette really is you know it's like not doing to other people what you wouldn't like having done to yourself um and where possible where you can you know you should should be sort of you know, be decent about things you know there's nothing worse than so you're having a few fish off a spot that spot's producing for you you're having them and then all of a sudden the lead start coming in <laughs> from all do- directions <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that, like <laughs> Yeah, it happens. It does happen. I had it on Wickmere ages ago, about 2015 it was. Yeah. And I was just fishing like the first... You've been to Wickmere? No. Yeah, it's like, obviously it's quite round, heart-shaped. And I was just in in kind of one corner. Yeah. And then, so I was fishing, fish, there was fish out there, fishing a few zigs straight out. And if you went around the corner, you could fish out to where these fish were showing as well. And that's exactly what happened. I started fishing, no one in this corner. I was just all yeah. on my own, cast out, lovely. And then this old geezer walks by with his barrow. He's like, oh, he'll have a little wander around. No, he's seen a couple of the fish where I was, but because he's fishing around the corner, to him, he's just fishing straight out. But yeah, he's yeah. not gone, oh, whereabouts are you fishing, mate? No, no. It's like, he's just gone, doom. <laughs> but yeah. that's maybe just... Um, it's just different... Yeah, some anglers just don't think like, oh, maybe I could ask him where he's fishing because we're in a corner and it might be quite tight, you know. Yeah. But clearly not. <laughs> yeah, like the amount of time I've had, <laughs> I've had well. <laughs> like pike anglers at Orient, just like they've got the heart. It's a six thousand acre lake, and I'm just in this little bay, and they yeah. want to cast their lure all over where I'm fishing. Yeah. Um, I've had that loads yeah. of times, um, and on the other side of the times, I've I've driven my bivy boat into a bay. It's 500 acres in size. I see one bivy boat, boat in there and I turn around and come out the bay. I'm not, I don't, I don't want to fish in that bay if someone no, else is in there. No. I, I want it all to myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, going back to the original question, etiquette, you know, where you can, you know, it is nice to treat others as you wish to be treated. But at the same time, we're all there to do the same thing. If you've got any, um, yeah, little stories that you want to share, just, write them on here and we'll read them out <laughs> I'm sure there's a few wouldn't have, wouldn't have brought it up otherwise um, actually can I just tell one yeah I, yeah I want yeah. to tell one funny one <laughs> we, I, I was fishing at, at Bayswater in, in October um, I think it was 2017 something like that um, and Adam Penning was fishing in swim one and he was on the fish like properly properly on them they were like he's fishing out towards an island and they were just showing on the same spot time and time and time again now this guy i won't mention his name but he went round in swim nine that basically fishes out it's the same distance to the island from nine as it is from one but it is adam's water where everyone knows that it's adam's water so i've walked around and spoken to this guy in swim nine and he's got three rods out fishing short and one lent against the bivy right and i was like what's going on with that one I oh, said, so it's going out in a bit, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, right, it's going out in a bit. Anyway, I've I've heard him swoosh it at some point. I wasn't in the swim at the time, but I heard him swoosh it. 
and Adam wasn't looking at this particular time, <laughs> but it, it, it basically landed exactly where Adam was fishing. Oh, no. Adam heard it go in, shouted out, and then <laughs> and mate, he then said, oh, I thought it was in the clip, right? <laughs> <laughs> But he he pretended to wind it in and he didn't. No. He just chucked it on the floor. So he's like, he, rather than wind it in, he just pretended to and then <laughs> threw it down and just like left left it out there. Um, yeah, that's Ang very good. A a angling etiquette gone wrong. Yeah, that's very good. I like that one. <laughs> Does Penny know that that he didn't bring it in? Well, probably uh, not. I don't know if he, he knew if he brought it in or not. But I remember later that evening we were all getting a kebab and a burger in. And there's about 10 blokes all stood in the swim waiting for the food to be deli delivered. And Penn has charged into the swim. He went, who cast him my <laughs> swim? <laughs> it's like pitch black with a head torch on. Who cast him my swim? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, fishing wouldn't be, you know, as entertaining as it is without those moments. Yeah. It wouldn't. You don't like it when it's done to you though, do you? No. no. But it's fu it's funny looking back at it. Yeah, it was funny watching from the outside. Yeah. 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 Because <laughs> because you're not involved. Yeah. Uh yeah. right. Joshua McKnight. Hi Daryl. I'm going to Gigantica in December. What would be your opening plan of action, especially with the change in baiting from the boat? Is that still going on? No, I think they stopped stop that. They stopped, what, yeah. Stopped it straight away. I think really fearful of um piles of bait ending up on the bottom. Mm. I don't, yeah, so they, they wanted to do it to feed the fish up. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, just change their minds, like, yeah, about it. But, yeah, going back to it, if you're going to Gigantic in December, it can be very swimmy at that time of year. Um, if you'd have read the catch reports, you'll know that Alcatraz Coes are the absolute, like, they are the top swims, Alcatraz and Coes at that time. After that, Alamo's in the mix. Um, Beach can be in the mix. Um, and the other swims are very, very, very much hit and miss. On they can, you can catch them from any swim at any time, but those swims would be my. Excuse me, burping that red bull. <laughs> they would be my. Um, yeah, I'll be looking at Coes and Alcatraz immediately. Alamo, Stink, and Beach would be next sort of in the line of pole. Those those ones. Anything around the middle of the lake. There's um, some tyres in the central body of the lake and. The fish tend generally, as a general rule, to mass up in the central area of the lake in the winter. So, and boily crumb, sweet corn, and ten millers, loads of smart liquid. That's what I, when when I was in it hasn't done really well. If you the films on the app, obviously the um, December film, uh, yeah, Stokes he was next to me in pole. He caught a load. Carl was on Coes, he caught a load, and I caught a load out of Alcatraz all around that central bit. But um, fishing at range, like 30 odd wraps if you can, um, on clear spots, tight with small small bait. They love sweet corn, like I say, hemp as well. Hemp, hemp sweet corn, boily crumb, a um, bit smart liquid. Plastic tipped hook baits worked well for me. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Cool. Uh, good luck. Uh, luck. Glenn Burton evening lads off to Burners next weekend is it time to start using maggots in my mix so autumn this time starting to it's 12 degrees it dropped down to 9 yeah. degrees it was on the I way th home yeah I think maggots are a great bait in October I think October November if you, if you like, when are maggots at their best probably October November December that sort of yeah well, basically what happens on a lot of lakes um, like at this time of year is the weed starts to die back and as the weed starts to die back, all the little bugs and shrimps and things that are in that weed start to become available. Um, and the fish start to get tuned into that sort of natural bait. Um, and I do think that maggots, although they're not mimicking it exactly, um, I think they're just, they're a great bait um, at, that, at that time. Um, so yeah, if you've got a bait boat, Bait boats and maggots are absolutely like combined, are lethal, you know, because obviously when you're spawning maggots and the spawn's getting big open reservoir, um, Bernard's is big open lake, and if you get a lot of wind on it, it's quite hard to be accurate, and you're obviously putting maggots everywhere. Whereas if you could get them in your bait boat and drive them out, you're keeping them more com compact. Um, and I've had a few good sessions on the, not, I think I've generally fished Bernard's late winter, so like February, March time. Um, and done really well. I haven't I haven't fished it December sort of or, or or like now October, but I do think that 
yeah, like the same the same tactics will work there. Like hemp, hemp, boiler crumb and maggots. You could put a little a little three part mix out, you know, a three way split. Um, but even straight maggots on their own, fifty fifty with some hemp, it'll be a great a great starting point. Um I'd fish I'd fish a big bunch of them on the hook or or, or a blatant pop up over the top. Cool. Yeah. I'll uh, just get this quickly, look go on. The I've not fished it loads, but the 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 near end that you come up to, um, in the middle of the, if you treat that near end as like a bowl, like where the island is, the middle zone of that first bowl end that you come up to, so it's like swims one and two fish out towards it, and swims seventeen and sixteen fish out towards it. They're they're quite often out in that in that main central body of water. Not always, but that's that's where I've had my best sessions. And like, speaking to other people, I know they get there a lot. Cool. Um, itchy nose, itchy nose. Itchy nose. Uh, uh, Luke Williams newbie here hope you boys are well this time of year what would your go to approach be on a holiday style venue in the UK so a holiday style venue is um, I'm guessing where you book the lake exclusively yeah um, maybe like one of the ones with lodges or something around it something yeah. like that like high stock lakes whether, whether it doesn't really make any real odds on on whether it's a holiday venue, day ticket lake, it's more to do with the type of venue, gravel pit, silty lake, weedy lake, whatever it is. But as I've just just mentioned, that if it's weedy, a lot of the time the weed will be dying back, releasing or making that natural food available. Um, and on pressured lakes, and I'm guessing this lake is, if it's a holiday venue, you've got people around it all the time. On pressured venues that see a lot of bait, you know, they, and they've been caught. You know, the fish have been caught through the spring, through the summer, through the early part of the autumn. They can really sort of suddenly be hard to catch because they they they're not eating your bait as readily. They're a bit wary. They're already full. You know, at this time of year, they're getting close to you know peak weights. They're re- replenished from from spawning and stuff. And my approach would be certainly not to fill it in. You'd have seen in a lot of those summer videos that we put out. We're banging in buckets and buckets and buckets of particles you know that's not where you want to be now you know you're you're on the cusp of winter it's not winter but you're on the cusp and by that i mean that the fish are they're getting picky and alternative baits in smaller amounts you know little pva mesh bags a couple of spoms around a rod um yeah minimal you know you you of it's a really deep lake, you know, somewhere like Grenville's, you're still going to be filling it in because there's loads and loads of fish, they love bait, etc. But I'm guessing the lake that you're going to is quite pressured, quite small. The fish have probably had a battering all year round. They're probably sort of getting a bit cautious around the standard sort of spawned area and loads of boilies. So I'd say, yeah, little mesh bags, little bit of naturals if you're allowed it, minimal. And, and look for them showing at night to tell you where you need to fish. Showing at night and look for bubbling. They're the, they're like, location is obviously number one always. And my top tips for this time of year is to look for them showing at night and look for where they're bubbling um, for for your location. Cool. I keep getting asked about this all the time. Jagantica, the social that we're doing. Yeah. Have we got the whole complex? No, because we've split it over. We did have a whole complex, but we've split the dates. So it's like there's one on Road Lake and one at Gigantica at different times now. Right, but yeah. they're both. We've got so we've so we've got a social at Gigantica. Yeah, and a social at Road Lake. And a social at Road Lake. Yeah. I've, we need to obviously release the details because people keep asking me. about Basically, them. the Gigantica one's already sold out. Okay, the so Gigantica, the Road Lake one. Road Lake one is going to be available soon. Okay. Yeah. So, what's the best way if people want to show show some interest? Email, email, our email. Yeah. 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 If you yeah. email the info at cartfix.tv. Yeah. Yeah. The gigantic one sold out. Okay. If you yeah, so anyone that wants to come um, or show an interest, um, send an email to info at cartfix.tv um, to say I'd like to come to the Road Lake Social. Are these dates confirmed? Which ones you got? 13th of September. Yeah. Yeah. So 13th of September 2025, yeah? Yeah. That's when it is. Um, so, yeah, just send an email to info at carfix.tv. Once we've um, worked out numbers and stuff, then we'll basically email out 
the information and then it'll be just first come first serve because these spots usually sell out so quickly it's easier to send an email out um you say you're coming we pencil you in you have to obviously pay a deposit yeah. straight away and then that's your space confirmed if you don't pay a deposit obviously you lose your place yeah. um so yeah e email info at carfix.tv and then we'll take it from there but um let's go back to the questions <laughs> um what we got uh, Jay Cole watching from the syndicate tonight after a couple of Daryl's old Pitwood friends. He's what? Watching from the syndicate tonight after a couple of Daryl's old Pitwood friends. Oh, oh okay. So he's fishing, he's <laughs> he fishing. fishing Pitwood. No, no, no. Because the fish from Pitwood oh, got they sold. Into, oh. like, I, think, I don't Where want to say now? the name of it because oh, he hasn't okay. said it. But, okay. Um, They're somewhere else. Yeah, they basically, we, I was in the syndicate um, called Pitwood. Okay. We lost the lease on the lake oh. um, and we sold the fish. To okay. another syndicate. Okay. Yeah. That's what that's what I was doing during COVID, fishing them out. Oh. Uh Lewis Pitts. Hi mate, what flash do you use on your Canon uh camera for self takes? Mm, I wouldn't know what it is. Okay. It's just yeah, it's just this one of the standard stand speed they're called speed lights, yeah, aren't they? Something like that, yeah. Um yeah, it's just a sp the uh, uh, I don't know how many models they do, but it'd be the cheapest one, the cheapest yeah. speed light model that they do. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Cooksley just got a winter ticket for a lake which is 11 acres 40 fish uh, where would you start in deeper water also uh, where would you start in deeper water question mark potentially uh, also still very weedy I would start where I see in the fish um, you, if, it, if it is very weedy the fish will be hanging around the dying weed beds that's that's normal um especially if those dying weed beds are in some depth like a decent depth of water um but it's really hard every lake is unique in that if you've got a huge bed of reeds a huge overhanging tree big snag bush you know depending on the features on the lake will depend where the fish feel mo most comfortable um and it's it's all about putting putting in some time noticing what the fish are doing like seeing them in an area understanding why they're there and why they might come back so for example you might see a few fish show you might plumb around out there you might find a massive dying wee bit out there and that's that's where they're going to hold up for the autumn for for the winter and then you can target that area by looking for spots around where you've seen that activity or you might never see them in that spot again and th then you might notice them on another trip in an area they're going to look to hold up but i find that they move around less not they don't like stop moving entirely but as you get later into the year like now october onwards they're looking they're looking to be in similar areas and they might have two or three areas on the lake that they just once they get pushed out from pressure they move on to the other one and they just keep cycling those three areas but yeah my, my advice is always let them tell you where to fish try and understand why they're there you know what is the feature that's made them come here if you think it's a, a good one that'll make them come back find your spots in the area get your spots all clipped up write it down in your notes top keep the bait going in and yeah fish when you can um that would be my advice is always the same it's it doesn't matter on the lake it's it's find them find the best spots in that area and fish from there cool uh kyle wallace how do you find the super spod reels on your rods looking to get a set for my 12 foot sixes also how much line can you get on the spools well i've only used them once and that was at grenville when i caught that big one um in september the the wind on them is slightly heavier than a normal reel uh, and the reason for that is because obviously it's oscillating more for every turn so you you'll put you're having to put a little bit more work into the handle because it's spinning faster um, and they are fractionally heavier than my baseers but other than that i really liked them you know obviously i'll probably get used to them as well you'll get used to the heavier wind i'll get used to the slightly heavier weight um with regards to weight I mean, a line capacity, I put um, a 300 metre spool of the tapered cord of 15 pound long chuck on. And it was, you could have backed them a tiny, you might have got a tiny bit of backing on there. Um, so 300 metres of 0.33 slash 
point three five because I do think that line comes up a bit thick. Um, so yeah, I would say that you're getting yeah you, you'd easily get three hundred meters of point three five, but but they are shallow the spools. But you could probably if you bought them, I bet they do. There's um, like cross cast and emblem spools that are the same shape that would fit that reel with deeper spools. Um, if you look from the dial website at the at the emblem and the, and the cross cast spools, they'd probably fit and they'd probably be deeper as well. Deeper options for sure. Cool. Uh, Ryan Leach, evening lads. Good evening. Uh, evening. Joe Wynn, evening lads. Any advice on finding small gravel spots when I drag bare lead back and find small bumps of gravel, a clip and rechuck, but then struggle to find the same drop or gravel? Right. Well, that's interesting that he's fi- you're finding it and then you're struggling to refind it. Um, potentially, you are clipping too short. So, for example, if you you found the spot and you've wound down p- tight to it and stuck it in the clip, when you next feel the lead down with your rod, so you, you put it in the clip with the rod pointing at the spot and then you feel the lead down with the rod up like that, you're now that much short, you know, which could be six, eight, ten foot short. So I would always say once you've found your spot, bring your ro- open your bail arm, bring your rod to sort of 11 o'clock before you re-clip it and that should give you the enough line to be able to reach the spot that you've just found. Um, that's the only reason I, I could suggest that you can't refind that you might be clipping too short of your spot. Would make sense. Yeah. Uh, okay, we've got one. Uh, Sean Russell has asked a question about tigers. My question is about bait and tigers in particular. At what age in the fermenting process do you feel them to be at their best and how long would you advise keeping them? Can they go off? It's a question that hasn't really got an answer and it's probably down to opinion, um, a lot of it. I've personally mostly used tigers fairly fresh in that I've used them within the first five days after being boiled. Um, And obviously the longer that you've leave them, the more gloopy they get. Um, And I always get a little bit anxious when they start to smell vinegary and um alcoholy but again i've got a story for you when i was fishing at pitwood um one year i basically had two buckets of tigers i'd boiled up and not used and they just stayed in the van with the lid on from when i fished welly now i'd stopped fishing welly in the summer and then they'd been in my van from the summer until the following spring so i knew they'd be bad but one day I saw some fish in the edge and as I was leaving, a few, a few fish jumped out, I climbed out on this bush, I could see they'd been working the bottom there and I thought, I wish I had some bait to bait this spot for when I come back next week. And then I remembered these two buckets of tigers. Now I wouldn't have, I basically when I went to these buckets, I was concerned that I could destroy the spot as in by putting rotten bait, rotten bait on the spot and that would blow my chance. But long story short is I put these buckets of they had thick blue mould across the top of the, the water inside the buckets and the top layer of nuts had all dried out. And um, I put them onto this spot thinking that I might have ruined it. And when I come back a, a few days later, they dug a hole in the bottom and eaten the whole two buckets. And um, I caught over that spot the first night that I fished it and then I never caught another carp off it. <laughs> it was like really weird. And they'd eaten two whole buckets, dug a hole in the bottom and then I rebaited those spots with boilies and never caught another fish off them. Strange. Yeah, strange. But yeah, a lot of people a lot of people like fermented nuts. A lot of people talk about slimy nuts. Mm. I've done just as well on when they've been boiled the day before and the water's really thin. And I've done just as well when the water's really thick. Um they're just good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Leach has asked a question. Uh, fishing a small five-acre lake in France next year in late April, I find the smaller lakes are sometimes harder than the bigger lakes. Do you have any tips on how to approach a smaller lake or what you would do differently to fishing a bigger lake? Well, basically, the bigger the lake, generally, the more naturally or obliging the carp will be, generally. Generally, bigger lake carp, when they find bait, they'll eat it because they just they see they go across larger 
deserts of no bait before they bump into bait and when they find bait they tend tend to be more obliging not always but tend to be smaller lake carp that live in smaller environments that especially when they're under lots of pressure and if there's lots of natural food can be very very turned off by big piles of bait they just see it as pure danger they're literally uh, a big pile of bait to them is literally a mouse trap waiting to go off they've been caught on it before and they treat it with um, contempt now i would say on smaller lakes the sp- it, spots become smaller you know the the importance of how accurate your casting can be can be even more 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 intense um you have to have to be more subtle generally on the on the smaller lakes and you have to be more precise um so yeah i would take time in pinpointing the spots that i'm going to fish and i would be very cautious by by putting especially like larry bait like big big piles of boilies or big piles of sweet corn can be alarming to fish that live in sort of small small pressured ponds so yeah less is more and be particular with your spot choice Cool. Nathan Harrington has asked, do you ever use bottom bait straight out of the bag or do you think they have to be critically balanced? I don't anymore. But you eat them out of the bag. <laughs> I eat cell. <laughs> and I eat those Benoffee shelf types. <laughs> um, I, I tend not to fish straight out of the bag, but only because I like using that combi multi-rig. And I don't, and although you can use a bottom bait straight out of the packet... I just think it's more likely to sit nicely on the bottom of a slow sinking hook bait. Um, I, I generally always fish all of my hook baits with some element of buoyancy. But if you, when you watch the underwater, you do see that baits that wobble around, that flutter about when the fish are near them, the fish really, really don't like the baits to move. So straight out of the bag bottom bait will 100% work. Um, and I should probably use them more often because not many people do. Uh, Luke Williams, bait-wise, do you think common carp and mirror carp have different preferences? I find I catch more commons on sweet baits and more mirrors on fish meal. Is this something you have found? That uh, yeah, I've never even. No, I've that. heard stuff like this before. You know, you'd like you could say that. Mirrors have been, as a general rule, through the through the years, they've been farmed more. And mm-hmm. if they've been farmed more, they've been fed pellet more, so they've been conditioned to eat artificial baits more. Whereas mm-hmm. a common carp is maybe I'm not saying this is true, but mm-hmm. like is like maybe more natural. Mm-hmm. Um, I find certain carp have over the years shown preferences in lakes you know that they prefer fish meal boilies or they prefer nut based boilies or they prefer particles or like there's carp in Gigantica that have only ever been caught on zigs you know I think it's to generalise commons and mirrors like say mirrors only like fish meals Mm -hmm. commons only like sweet baits I think that's quite a big generalisation probably more down to the fish itself I, I, I do think they probably each fish potentially has a preference of what they go for. I think big, greedy fish, right? Say, so say big, friendly ones, right? Say so a big, fat, friendly mirror that gets caught. Mm. Say it's in a lake and gets caught four or five times a season. So I would say a fish that gets caught four or five times is relatively friendly. No matter like if it's in a pressured lake or whatever, you know, if it's coming out four or five times, he obviously he knows he's getting caught. Yeah. But he, he he's willing to play Russian roulette with those boys because yeah. he likes them, you know. Yeah. And I think I think greedy, friendly carp love boilies. Yeah. <laughs> they just yeah. do. They just do. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, some I've heard I've heard similar. Like when I used Nash bait back in the day, they used to do this bait called F one, which um it had like this. It was quite. It was a very strange smelling bait. It was like almost black in colour super sweet in taste quite at almost like a, 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 a like a blended nut sort of texture to it um and it had a real track record to pull it like catching big commons mm. um so yeah I, I do think certain baits may may yeah 
I find it quite interesting. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's I think it's hard to say for fact. You know, yeah. you can notice things. It's a yeah. bit like the full moon. You know, yeah. you can catch a big carp in the full moon, but you can blank too. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, you caught on at Grenville. You caught that fifty-seven the night before, wasn't it? I, I think, think it was a night or two before, but yeah. like a lot. Obviously, I can't prove any of what I'm about to say about the full moon. But for me, I've caught a lot of big fish on the exact night of the full moon. But I've also done quite well on the two nights in. I've caught big fish mm-hmm. on the two nights in up to it. And people on the on the moon apps, it still says that the fishing efficiency is good after the event. Mm-hmm. Whereas me personally, I, it's all about the in, the one, yeah. two in and the night. And it, once the night's over, it's done. In my, well, mm-hmm. in my, from my experience, I've never done well afterwards. Um, well, that's the thing. Like, you, if if you're gonna look at anyone's stats from fishing around the full moon, like from one angler, you would look at yours because you're the one that looks into it a lot and fishes yeah. around that time. So I always try. I, I, I when I'm plotting my big sessions, when I'm going somewhere and I really mean business and I'm intense. I always like my sessions to end mm-hmm. just after yeah. the full moon because it's no good just turning up to lake and just going, it's the full moon, I'm going to catch the big one tonight. Mm. There's more to it than that. As in, mm. what you need to do is is follow the path of mm-hmm. it, like all the activity, the signs, mm-hmm. the information, so that you find yourself in the right place at the, the right, right time and on the right spot. Yeah. Um, and maybe I... Of, uh, I look back on all the filming trips we've done over the years the amount of times that the big one or the biggest fish of the session we catch it on the last night now is that because the bait's been established I don't think so I think it's more a case that we're established on mm. the lake where you're you're just you're, you're finding crumbs and you're just yeah. literally just you're yeah. f- winding in these crumbs until the until the end of the session and actually you it does happen a lot, actually. Like, now you say it on the filming trips. You, yeah, it does. Like you, you, you. I mean, sometimes you go out and catch a big one straight away, but that's yeah, yeah. just how it goes. But more often than not, we do s- almost, yeah, um, build up to to yeah. the end of, yeah. And I think that's like I, when I'm talking about moon phases. Like, mm. I don't, I couldn't tell you how they affect the fish or why they affect the fish. Um, I don't think the full moon's a particularly good time necessarily to catch lots of fish. But I've caught numerous of my best ever carp mm. on the full moon. Now I'm obviously always fishing on them on those nights, but I've never just turned up on the full moon and dragged the big one out. No. There's been like the yes. it, there's always much more of a, a lead into it. And my advice is if you're gonna, if you if you, if you're going to fish around moon phases, you want to do some preparation, some time in the lead up, so that you know you you when you choose your spot, when you choose your swim, mm-hmm. when you your location has been sort of thought about, you've based that around good information rather yeah. than just winging it. Yeah. Cool. Um, Kyle Wallace caught a new PB at £36 last night on the multi-combi rig. Well done. Send us a pic. Put a picture up on the uh, community page if you haven't already. Yeah. Um, Sean Russell, also cheers for the heads up on the Diver Super Spod Reels. No problem. Uh, Bait Wise, we've done that one. Joe Wynn. Uh, Joe Wynn is going to Blasford. Also, any tips on Blasford Hill over the winter? Not fished it much, but looking to do a bit of sessions over the winter there. Congratulations on the patch fully. Okay, so we did do a film. Uh, me and Ash went there. I think the last film of, on Blasford. And I do a bit of an overview in that film of the best areas. Obviously, it'd be quite hard for me to describe, but as you come down the track, you turn left and you've got the eye, the bigger island at that end of the lake. Now, I've done best around the as you turn left and sort of the opposite side of the island with the river behind you. When you've got the river behind you and the island in front of you, um, that area of the lake has been very consistent for me over the years. You know, I've fished that lake for nearly 20 years or more. Um, and always fished it in the winter and they quite often are in that part of the lake but like i say watch that film um that's on the app the the latest blasford film i think it was like last winter um and tactics wise they love 10 mil baits in there there's no need to spawn so it's sort of eight nine wraps to the island maybe 10 wraps 
Um, you can catapult 10 millers most of the time. Maybe take some 15s because if it's windy, your 10s might be dropping short. But catapult tactics, straight boily, pop-ups and snowmen, wafters, all of it works. It's it's no weed in there. It's pretty, pretty, pretty easy. When I say easy fishing, it's not stressful fishing. Um, lovely little lake, full of fish. And if you fish in that area and the areas that I mentioned in that film, then um, you'll definitely catch some fish. Yeah, I just found it. If you just search um, Blasford, it'll come up. This, I think, is that right? Two films are done on there. We've yeah, got yeah, late, yeah. late Winter Action and yeah, the post spawning the, the Late Winter Action Blasford film, yeah. Yeah, you'll see it on there. Uh, right, where are we? Uh, da, 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 da. Rob Knight, something a bit different from the combi multi-rig. Um, questions, given the mammoth sessions you've done, what's the longest you've ever gone without flushing the to- without flushing toilet? <laughs> Without flashing toilet. Yeah, no idea what he means. Um, I don't know. I've got no idea. No. Um, Nathan Harrington, are you going to be releasing the footage of Daryl's underwater rigs? I think you mentioned in the last Q and A you would be. Is he on about quarters? I reckon. Yeah, I reckon yeah. he's on about that. Do you know? Is it I've, got, I've not heard anything about it. To be fair, um, I'll I'll be seeing the guys from Quarters on a masterclass shoot in November. So. Um, I'm guessing I'll hear a bit more about what's going on with um, releases and whatnot then. But yeah, um, you probably know more about that. I, no, I'm not too sure. Yeah, I'm not sure when they were, what they were planning on doing with it. Yeah, because they've got the the thinking. Was it thinking tackle we did at Carp Lantis? Yeah. So, so that'll that'll come out, and then if your stuff comes out, it'll be after that. I would have thought. Yeah. Not too sure. Uh, Matt W, how do you feel about uh, how do you feel the lead down in really shallow water? Well, the key is on how well you hit the clip. Um, it's difficult to feel the lead down in water under four feet at range. You know, that obviously the, the, the further out you are and the shallower the water, the more difficult it becomes. You know, if you're fishing at 150 yards in 20 foot, easy. You're fishing at 150 yards in three foot, almost impossible, I'd imagine. Um, the, and the, the best way to, to do it in shallow water is to make sure that when you hit the clip, you're not hitting the clip really hard. You're hitting the clip, but you're anticipating hitting the clip, cushioning it down. And when you're cushioning it, da- cushioning it down, you're actually staying in contact with the ledge. You know, the line is still taut to the lead as you're cushioning it down. It hits the water and you feel it down. It's almost like you feel it hit the water and you feel it hit the bottom. Um, and it's really hard to judge the quality of a drop in that situation because it's so quick it's splash bang you know when it's descending through the water at a certain pace you're used to that when it's deep and then you notice it smack down and it's easier to tell um the quality of that drop but in shallow water the further out you go the more difficult it be and the only the best advice i can give you is just be really sort of smooth on hitting the clip and try and stay in contact with it as it hits the water cool um I'm just trying to go back up to the questions. Jonathan King. Hi, lads. New member. Loving the content. Aside from naturals, is there any better bait combination of hemp and corn to trigger a feeding response as we head into winter? Aside from naturals? Yeah. Um, Boily crumb is a real good one. Boily crumb is brilliant. Um, And boily crumb soaked in attractive liquids, whether that be... Hemp juice, tiger nut juice, smart liquid. Um, yeah, boily crumb is a great carrier of liquids. So, um, yeah, if you're not going to go down naturals and you're already talking about hemp and corn, the next thing that I would say is good to try would be boily crumb. And one that I haven't used much myself, but I keep saying I'm going to try it, is buckwheat. I think buckwheat is... Um, it's like a ma- it looks like a massive hemp. It's like um, just a bigger, more f- fluffy a particle. So, yeah, hemp and corn, brilliant alternative baits. Obviously, naturals. But if you're gonna, if you can't use naturals and they don't allow that, then um, boily crumb soaked in other liquids, like I say, hemp or tiger nut juice or smart liquid, that sort of stuff. Cool. I know you haven't uh, done any fishing on the road, like have you? 
Road Lake Gigantica. Yeah. yeah. I fished it once or twice, yeah. well, like 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, D- Dale's going to Road Lake. He said, would you approach it the same way as the main lake or would you approach it, uh, how would you approach it this time of year? So next week. <laughs> I think, I think they're really like, if you're going to use boilies, you don't want to be going mad. They love the house maze there. Like they, they see a lot of it, you know. Mm. Anything that goes in abundance becomes like natural food. Mm. Um, so I don't think you go far wrong with that. But yeah, I, th- I think you've got to be cautious at this time of year. I think depending on your swim choice, if you get in the flyer, say say you go to Road Lake, you get the best swim, you've got all the fish in the lake in front of you because it can be very much like that on there. The fish can be very balled up. If you're in the flyer, you can put buckets and buckets and buckets of bait in and haul. Like Rob, uh, Rob's done it, Rob uh, Burgess. Mm. But if you're not in the flyer, the last thing you want to do is put buckets mm. and buckets of bait out. And if, you, if you're if you not in the flyer, I'd be fishing bags, four spoms over a rod, eight spoms over a rod. Because you what you're not certain of, especially when you're not in the flyer, is the guy the week before you might have blanked and you might have put 30 kilos out. Mm. So, yeah, bags with... Bags with minimal bait over the top. If you're not, if it's not evident that you're on loads of fish, really, really go cautiously at this time of year. Cool. Right, we'll do a few more questions. Yep. Um, we've got one from Ryan about the baziers. Hi, Darrell. Hope you're all good. Looking at the baziers, what is the advantages of the maglock version? I don't know. I don't know. Never heard. I'm of hoping it. you would. <laughs> no, I'm not really up on tackle. I'm not. Um, yeah, I've okay. not looked at we the, can, the latest version. We can pass on that one. Sorry, uh, Owen West. At this time of year, when you will st- when will you start to introduce maggots, worms, and naturals? Uh, would it co- coincide with the temperature change? That's more more to do with the time of year. I always think from not the middle to the end of September um, is when I'd start thinking about it. October is a great time for natural bait, as is November. Um, but like say say you're fishing early October and you're using naturals, you know, in some situations I've fished over say twenty spoms of maggots and I've done really well in doing so. And on the same lake, as you transitioned from the early part of October into November, twenty spoms of maggots on some of the lakes I fish has been far too many. And a lot of the time, especially when I was fishing at Bayswater, like an egg sized mesh bag. So like if you imagine like a large egg of pva mesh filled with maggots like that was the optimum amount in a bag you know a lot of the times when i was fishing now i was fishing with like a foot long sock thinking more maggots around the rig must be better um and it actually wasn't you know like my friend phil i used to be there for like two or three nights at a time i might feel used to fish the overnighters around me and he was using smaller bags than me and it became evident in the back half of the autumn that he was out catching me and as soon as I changed the smaller bags I started catching more I think when they're super tuned to the naturals you don't want anything too blatant too obvious just like a small amount of attraction small egg size bag exactly where the fish are minimal disturbance can be um, lethal and one of my favorite ways to fish the maggot bag is with that maggot liner set up because it, there's no obvious hook bait you know, a lot with carp fishing, so a lot of the time we're fishing real obvious, big, blatant hook baits. Whereas um, the maga liner is just so stealth, and the hook holes with it as well, really, really good. So yeah, I'd, if if you're fishing a lake where you can use maggots, you can spawn a few out early October. But as it starts to get harder, sort of back in the like November time, yeah, smaller bags can be really good. Not on all lakes, but I'm, I'm sort of. I'm thinking back to the sessions that I've had at Bayswater and whatnot. But you say you go somewhere like Farlow's, you know, you can put out the, what is it, you'd have a pint every 24 hours or mm, four pints yeah. every 24 hours, whatever it is, you put that out and they'll just come in and mow it because there's hundreds and hundreds of fish. So it's, it is lake dependent, but yeah, I would say definitely be cautious as we're moving out into, we're in autumn now, but over the next few weeks, it's going to get cold quick and the, they'll be slowing up for sure. Cool. Matt W, how can I ensure when casting a naked chod that the chod section stays up near the top bead? Is there a specific casting technique? It's to do with how you fill the lead down. Now, obviously the depth of water is going to come into it a little bit. 
but you want to follow the lead down. Do you know, like, so you see some per people, they hit the clip, the lead pulls the rod out, and then they pull the rod back. When you pull the rod back, your chod section is going to slide down to that bottom bead and may get wedged there all the way to the lake bed. If you want for the the chod to sit up at that top bead, which I would recommend is, is what you're asking, I would recommend, is to hit the clip and follow it down so that you're encouraging the chod to slide up to that top bead and obviously sit over any bottom debris. But yeah, hit the clip, follow the lead down rather than pulling the lead back towards you. Cool. Luke uh, has said, I can hit the clip at 30 wraps with the rigs, but struggle to spot more than 25 wraps. I've got five and a half pound test curve rod and a big pit reel. Do I need to give it more power or is there something else I should do? It will be t the most important thing for long distance fishing, whether it's casting or spawning, is the diameter of your line. So you're going to want some thin spod braid, whether that's the corner one or somebody else's, but thin. You don't want any thick, ropey, coarse braid on your spod rod for sure. So thin, smooth casting braid, floating braid um, with a shock leader. And then... You, if you want to cast far, you probably want the medium spawn. The medium spawn is easier to move quickly. A lot of people have trouble moving the bigger size spawn fast enough to get it out there at long range. So a medium spawn and fill it up completely. So like fill it up, shake it to the nose, press the button, open it up, and there'll be an, like an empty cavity at the back of the spawn. Fill that up as well and give it another shake down. So it's like literally the whole spawn medium sized spawn is completely full and if you if you add saturated spot um, saturated boily crumb to your spot mix it's really dense and heavy and um yeah you'll be able to cast that like a ballistic missile that'll, that, that'll go out there no drama <laughs> uh alan turner says i'm at wickmere at the moment lol not many on here but it was him it's but it was alan he I'm, was I'm casting, ca I'm casting across <laughs> you now <laughs> Oh dear. Sean Russell can't see the questions. What am I doing wrong? Um I'm not too sure without seeing, but um yeah, they're on the i on the on the app, they're below the video player. Um and I think there is a little icon that you can press if you're in landscape mode, there's a little icon you can press. Um maybe with like a little speech mark and that makes the questions appear and disappear. So yeah. it's probably that if you're in landscape mode. Um, but they are there. I can see them. Uh, oh, yeah. Now he says, ignore that. Refresh the live. I should read the next question, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris Lines, what have you got planned for the rest of the year? Right, I've got a, I've got a week's fishing next week. Can't talk about that yet because it's to do with a film that's coming out. So we'll just leave that to one side. Um, I've then got a week's film for Mainline. Um, at Grenville's, which is um, in October, starting a week Monday. And I've got a quarter masterclass, which is possibly at Road Lake at the beginning of November. Um, and then, yeah, something else for Cart Fix probably later in November, which is yet to be decided. But that's, yeah, that will take us up to the middle of November, which is, yeah, I'm pr I'm flat I've been flat out for a little while now. Since Basically, I had seven weeks off, went to Orient in the summer, and I'm paying the price for it now. <laughs> Just like, yeah, relentless filming. Let's smash through a few questions because we're nearly there. We might as well do them. Okay. Um, J. Cole, how many UK 50s have you had now? Thirteen, I think. Yeah, nice. Uh, Josh Mercer, how do you prevent the slip D section on the multi combi rig from getting tangled? The slip D. Yeah. So, uh, the, yeah, prevent the slip slip. So the end. I guess it's the loop section. He was on. Uh, he's on about. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It never tangles. Like, it, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. as long as you're using. You it, shouldn't tangle. Maybe too long. He's too tired. Yeah, long. if you. If, Obviously, on the app, we've got the, the yeah. Pecker's Tecker section, and there's a step-by-step -step mm. how-to of that rig. It's also on the core of the YouTube. Um, and if you're fishing it exactly as I do with the anti-tangle tubing, um, the exact measurements and lengths as I do, then you should really, really not be having any tangles. Um, and if you are, I'd have to see it to know why. You yeah. Know, um, yeah. Uh, cool. Ryan Tredgett, 
Thank you for all the videos, guys. Uh, Daryl has really kept my passion alive over the years and would not still be bombing away if it wasn't for him. There you go. That's a nice little compliment for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> George Bunting, hope I'm on the cancellation list. Uh, if you've messaged me before, I guess it's for the road lake. If you message me before, you will be on a list there. And then I will, like I say, when we send out an email for the road lake, I'll you'll hopefully get the email. If... Um, you didn't give me your email address for whatever reason, send another email to info at cartfix.tv and, well, make sure you get the info. That's fine. Uh, Hamish Hendry. Uh, hi, Daryl. I'm booked on fullies in early March. If you were to go back at this time of year, would you do anything different to when you last visited? It's first time France trip for me, so any tips? Fullies. I was definitely say you'd, it'd be good to have a bait boat with an echo sounder. I think that's we really uh, you, obviously you can use a rowing boat, but when you're in a rowing boat and you're in a lake, you're drifting on the wind and it's quite murky, so you'll never stay on the same spot twice. And when you're in your swim, if you send the bait boat out towards a certain tree and you've got it clipped up, you can repeat the process time and time and time again. It's really really easy to be accurate like that. So um, yeah, I would say take a bait boat if you've got one. Make sure it's got an echo sounder. They like maggots, corn, hemp, like alternative baits in the colder weather. So, yeah, that's what I'd say. Central swims, you want to be in, I think I think we fish five. I can't remember, but you definitely want to be around the middle yeah, of the lake. Middle, yeah. yeah, middle of the lake. Um, and you definitely want a bait boat to make the most of it. Cool. Uh, Declan, evening lads, any tips on follows for this upcoming winter bait approach? Not fish far those loads. And when I have, obviously, we've made films there that, which are on the app. There's a couple of, there's a few films from far yeah, with me. Are, yeah. There's some with Search Rob. Search far you see. Um, you, you'll find far on on the app. But they they definitely like maggots and casters in there in the, in the, in the colder months. They, I think they generally have a, a like um, a 24 hour limit on how much bait you can apply. Um, the main bowl is quite a good area, quite consistently holding fish in the autumn and in the winter. But um, you need to you need to get over there and find out what's going on. Speak to the the guys in the in the tackle shop will know. And one off sessions, you might stumble lucky and get and catch a few. You might get in a good peg, get on the fish. But if you're consistent, as in you get over there fairly frequently, like once a week, once every other week, stay in contact with what's going on. You'll be you'll get an idea of where the fish are holding up, and like I said earlier, they don't they won't be moving too far really. They'll generally stay in the same sort of areas through the from the late autumn and winter. Um, and you can have some massive hits at Farlows if you if you get in the right swim at the right time. You, oh, we had thirty odd fish, I think mm. twenty odd, thirty odd fish. Mm. I can't remember, but um, you can really have a good hit there because there's there's hundreds and hundreds of fish in Farlows. But you can easily blank if you're not in the the right spot you've got to, you've got to find out where they are um and yeah you can definitely catch them lovely job um right uh kyle wallace has asked about tigers i think the preparation of them do you want to gloss over it again or yeah do you real, just... real real quick you know there's loads of people who says you can add this x y and z to your tigers to make them ferment blah 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 blah, blah. let's do, let's do a daryl how do you prepare your tigers we'll do it as a real <laughs> how, how, how do I prepare my tigers? <laughs> I put them into my burco dry. I fill them up with lake, not lake water, rainwater from the the outside of my house that's in the water butt. And I usually use twice the volume of water to nuts. So if you've got one bucket of nuts in the burco, I put two buckets of water. I turn the burco on. If it's a larger size nuts, like the extra large ones, I boil them for half an hour to 40 minutes. If it's smaller ones, 20 minutes to half an hour. Um, once I've been boiling for half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever it is, um, I turn them off and I leave them overnight in that water. And then if I want to use them the next day, they're good. And if, I, if I'm not going to use them the next day, I stick them in the freezer. So, But it's really important that from most people will tell you to boil tigers, uh, soak tigers, then boil them. I boil them first, then soak them. But the most important thing is that they've had time to fully expand so they don't do that inside the carp's stomach. Lovely job. Kevin McManus, who came on the socials, has asked if we're going to do any UK socials. I don't think there's any time. 
We'll be pretty stretched to do that, I think. It'd be nice to do like a like a you know a long weekend or something like that. It'd be yeah. nice to do it. It's just time. Yeah, and yeah. if you get on the, on the venues, it would take it. You'd have to book them in well in advance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, we'll finish with. I don't know how you pronounce your name, so I'm going to call you Mister Last. Mister Last. Fit, yes, his name ends in Last, but okay. I don't. Um, yeah, I don't want to get it wrong. Anyway, it's. Um, Good evening, guys. Daryl, I see you uh, using different length of line liners on the multi-rig. Uh, for example, the post on the quarter official Insta um, this evening is much longer than the length of 1.2 centimetres you were showing in the one of your YouTube. Um, how how to tie the multi-rig. What would be your go-to at the moment on the multi-rig with a wide gape size 6 and Y length the line liner or shrink tube. I'm, yeah. I'm with him. Yeah. With him. Length, yeah, of the braid part. <laughs> right <laughs> on the quarter video that or the post that they put out. I'm pretty sure that's from Lake Bled when I was using uh, size fours, and I had some prototype kickers that were a bit longer. So when I'm using size fours, I'm using a two centimetre kicker, so a long one on the size four. When I'm using the size six, I'm using a one point two centimetre kicker. The braided section for the size six is three and a half centimeters, and the braided section for the size four is four and a half centimeters. I hope that helps. Beautiful. Yep. Free eels march. Peg ten. Any info? I've only fished peg ten once. Obviously, we filmed it. There's yeah. uh, two films on the uh, um, yep. Yeah. Full Moon Monsters, is it? Yeah. Did, when did that was October? That was not it or November? November. November. Yeah. yeah but obviously. Right. The swim's a swim, yeah. you know. Uh, I'd be looking out by the island. I just think that they scoot round the island. I think yeah. they, I just do think they're not tight. It's not the sort of islands you want to be drilling in under the trees. You just cast out there, you pull the lead down the gravel shelf, and you just feel mm. it sort of. You find a nice bit of clear, smooth pea shingle gravel off the island. Um, you don't want to be fishing in anything shallower than five foot, you know. But yeah, find something out along the island. Might that I'd want to be fishing along the island in March. Just quick one in for for the maggots. Um, Neil Wellows asked, in autumn, would you prefer to use live or dead maggots? Do you use dead maggots much in, in autumn? Well, so not not dead maggots. I've used suffocated maggots. Okay. So they're not dead. They'd come back to life if you put them out, if you left them out in the bucket. Yeah. But a lot of time, I like to have them like sealed up so that they've gone into that sort of like. <laughs> Well, it sounds horrible, but coma state. You don't know what I mean? They're, like, they're just asleep, you know, Just but they're still alive. Um, I like to put them out like that so that they don't wriggle into stuff. Yeah. But I also quite, I quite like putting a mix of sort of ones like that out and some, because I like them to have to work for some of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think that when you drop, spawn them out there and they're in that sort of sleepy state and they're on, the, they ain't moving. They're just mm-hmm. sitting there in piles where I think it's better if they, you're not wasting your money either. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> they have to search. I think, yeah. Okay. I think a mix, a mix of sort of dead and well, not dead, but like steel ones and moving ones because the moving ones aren't going to move for very long because they're going to mm. get suffocated. For <laughs> they short. don't walk. No, but you know what I mean. They're like they're wriggling off. They're wriggling off. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. We've got one last question. Okay. From beer bobs and techno. Yes. <laughs> yes. Beer boobs and techno. Yeah. Uh, easy Bobs. gents. Hope I'm not too late for a pissed up question. Wee. When fishing a weedy water as the weeds it's actually a good question. When the fish when fishing a weedy water as the weed starts dying down, do I avoid those areas? So you spoke no. earlier about the weed breaking up. Yeah, a lot of the time fish will hold up around dying weed beds. And the reason they're holding up around dying weed beds is is one is for cover, but two for all the natural food that suddenly like becomes available as the weed recedes. The food becomes available, and you'll see the birds like really smashing the dying weed beds, and the fish will be doing exactly the same. There you go. Right. So, well, yeah, were you going to say something? I was just going to close it out. <laughs> but if you've got something, to no, say. I was just going to say next next week we have got. Um, It'll either be your Grenville video, Grenville film, or it'll be my vlog next week, and then yep. we'll have Luke Valerie's on the pump houses the week after, um, and then we'll be into November. So yeah, Come get quick. out fishing if you can. Yeah, make the most of it because it's before you know it, it's going to be winter, mm. um, and I would say like the next the next. 
three weeks a great time to catch a big one. A lot of the a lot of the lake's biggest fish will put in a, a, an appearance through October, first week in November, and then it's going to get rock hard, and we will be wishing we done more time when we should have done. Cool. Go on, close close us out. Right. Well, thank you very much for joining us uh, for our fortieth Carp Fix Live, and hopefully we'll see you again next month. 